if you're on a winning team and you win a U16, but you're on the find on the fourth line and you're playing five minutes a, a, a night, yes, you won, but did you actually develop? Well, I am really excited today to have Matt Dumichel on the show. As all our listeners know, I love talking about money. I like talking about investments, entrepreneurs, and hockey. So what, what can be better than that? And Matt is a contributor to the Coaches site, and he is best known for his series, The Hockey Factories. Welcome to the show, Matt. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. I was looking forward to uh, connecting with you. We, we've chatted a few times uh, online. It's uh, great to, to put a face uh, to the name and, and officially introduce myself. So thanks again for having me. My pleasure. And the Hockey Factories was uh, was a great series. Uh, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do it if you add on to it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, c- before we jump into what you're doing today with the coaches site and, uh, you know, the, the series Hockey Factories and talk about hockey uh, today, you know, can you give our listeners a little bit of a sense of, you know, who you are, where you came from and what brought you to that point? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, it's a dangerous first question. My my background is media and, and radio. So if you want to give me two minutes or two hours to talk about myself, I can do uh, both of those pretty easily. Uh, but uh, no, best best thing about me, um, I'm the, the dad of a nine-year-old, uh, Evelyn. Uh, my son is a six, turning seven. His name's Crosley. Um, I've got a beautiful girlfriend named Christine, a stepdaughter named Madison, who's 10. Uh, so I have no problem uh, finding things to do and uh, carpooling people around, but uh, Mm -hmm. my, my background's media. Uh, so I went to Humber College in Toronto and took a radio broadcasting course there and worked in radio for about 10 years um, with the intention of sports always being the the goal. So um, I've always been a sports fan, uh, had the opportunity to, to play um, when I was a kid. Uh, I played baseball, uh, but at no serious level or, or anything like that. So um, when I was working at the radio stations, I got to be involved with some hockey teams and doing some play-by-play stuff and, and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, I was let go in about 2012 or so. So at that point, I was for me, again, hockey's always been in the bloodstream or sports in general. Um, so my intention at that point, instead of being behind the mic describing the game, was to get involved in the game on the, on the front office side of things. So I worked for a a pro baseball team that was based out of London, Ontario for a year. Um, I worked with a pro basketball team that was in Windsor and won two championships with them. Uh, And then I got into more of the hockey front office and and assistant general manager with a couple of junior teams and uh, assistant GM with the Leamington Flyers of the Ontario Junior Hockey League now. So I'm five years into that. We won a Sutherland Cup championship a couple years ago. So uh, it's been uh, it's been awesome. It's been a a great ride and, and Certainly, uh, as I said, no no shortage of things to do. That's for sure. So, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's been yeah, a lot of fun. Like, yeah, that's an amazing, uh, you know, history. And uh, definitely, you know, see that common thread in terms of being involved with sports really, uh, you know, along the way. Now, mm. you know, how, how did you end up, you know, at what point and how did you end up working with the coaches site and become a host on their podcast? I mean, we had Aaron Wilbur, uh, mm. you know, the founder of the Co- coaches site on episode uh, 71 of our show. Okay. So he's a, uh, a friend of the show. And yeah. I, I just saw him this past week winter uh we were able to meet up while uh my my younger son was at a tournament in calgary so we finally met face to face which was uh which was awesome so how did you end up uh coming to work with them and then hosting uh you know their podcast yeah aaron is is fantastic and and i've learned so much from him and and his team getting to be involved with the coaches site it was really um i I reached out to aaron not to plug a podcast on a podcast but he's got the the glass and out podcast where he has conversations with uh, some of the best hockey coaches in the world um, and had been a big fan of it. Uh, again, from my media background, I had kind of contacted him with the angle of, has anybody ever interviewed you about the things that you've learned from the coaches that you've interviewed and how the podcast itself has changed you as a, as a coach uh, or somebody that, that runs a, a coaching platform like he does with the coaches site? 
So uh, they l- enjoyed the idea. We got in, had a, a conversation about uh, about that for his podcast. It went well. Um, my favorite story to tell of that afterwards is there was black as night, storms, rain, thunder, everything out my window. And I was just praying to anybody that would listen just to keep my internet connected, <laughs> my my one chance to, to connect with Aaron and, and record this. And it worked, so we were good. Um, and then he had yeah. asked if I had done any writing before. Um, he had this idea of doing a, an in-depth uh, look at some of the best hockey programs around the world and see how uh, they operate day to day, what makes them different, what uh, types of things they have in common, that type of theme. Uh, and so he had offered me the opportunity to do that. Um, and we've uh, taken it and run with it. And it has just been uh, of, of everything I've been able to do with, uh, with hockey and, and sports in general, truly uh, one of the great blessings that I have uh, getting the chance to connect with just some incredible people you'd never run into any other way uh, and tell some stories about some incredible programs. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Yeah. He's, he's got, so, he's got such a great platform there and I, I enjoy the, uh, the glass and out podcast as well. So no worries about uh, promoting <laughs> that because we have a lot of hockey people that are listening and uh, that's probably one, if they're thinking about coaching or interested in the coaching of the sport, I think it's a great place uh, and a great learning opportunity. For sure. So, yeah, you know, one of the things that's been getting debated for years, probably going back to even when I started playing, you know, almost 40 years ago at this point, has been, you know, what's the right model? How do we progressively, you know, encourage and, and get players to de- develop over time? And I think to some degree, you've seen this shift in terms of, the, the players and where they're coming from, even in the drafts alone, and then who ultimately ends up playing at a professional level. And, and you've had the opportunity to re- research many of the top programs in the world. You know, o- Okanagan Hockey Academy, Shattuck St. Mary's, you did a piece on them, which, uh, you know, my younger son goes to, mm-hmm. John Godler, Fralunda, the Dallas Stars Elite, and, and probably many others. You know, I, I, what do the programs that you re- that you research what really separates them from you know just your average local hockey program that's in your local community because i i think that that sometimes there's a lack of understanding there in in uh, in in some regards. There is for sure. It's it's a great point, and and one of the interesting things about the articles that we've done at this point, we've done ten of them, um, and and from what we're planning on on doing with them, each one of them kind of takes on a life of its own. Um, they have their own ideals. Maybe there's a theme that comes up that kind of centers around the the article. But the other thing that's interesting too in the programs that we have looked at, uh, there are are some obvious similarities to it as well. Three big words that we take from all of that when they're going through their programs and, and getting a chance to see how everything works, collaboration, alignment, communication. Best things about all three of those, and, and I say this to some of the programs that I've spoken with as well that aren't to the level of a Jokerit or a Frolunda, is all of those things are free. Uh, that's not just a, oh, they've invested more money. They're the New York Yankees of this. They're putting all kinds of money into the program and this and that. They very well may be, and that's not the point of the article. The The point of what we were able to find from that is their, their program from top to bottom, and I'm talking, you know, if we use Yoke Raid in Finland as an example, they have a skating school uh, that they introduce kids to skating at three, four years old. Their first team players can be anywhere from 20 to 35 uh, years old Um, and everyone in between the communication between the coaches the alignment of the the verbiage that they use with their players um, how they they set out that development model is run from top to bottom and bottom to top all the way through uh, and and is a seamless transition I think one of the things that we see a lot with with youth hockey today is if there is a program that has a U10 team up into a U16 team, we'll say, they're operating almost as if they're seven separate entities and different teams when we're not looking as one organizational umbrella. So the U11 coach is teaching a player how to break out a certain way. The U12 coach is talking about a certain type of forecheck or power play or whatever the case may be. 
but they're not aligned. The thinking is not aligned through the program. It's really the coach that's coming up with that particular plan or platform based on what they're comfortable teaching. And what we're trying to do or or what you see a lot, and, and I use European teams as an example much more than North America, just from the research that I've done, is in Europe, it seems like they're adding tools to the toolbox as they go. In North America, we're rushing this a lot faster than it needs to in sense of teaching kids everything we know all the time. And I mean, if you tell me 15 things and you want me to remember all of them, statistically, if I remember four of them, I'm <laughs> probably pretty good. Like that's, you know, that, yeah. that's a reasonable expectation. So, you know, and that's where we get into, and you can break it down even further, right? It's it with the coaches, if they're not collaborative, if they're not sharing ideas, if we're not using the same language of this is not necessarily a system, but this is what we call the F1. Uh, this is what we call when we're chasing the puck. If there's somebody on us and we've got our back turned, this is what we're using to let that player know that there's somebody on them. If we're not joined together and, and, and collaborating with how that verbiage is used, we're teaching kids any number of different things and hoping at the end of the day they're catching all of it. And ultimately, we're not giving these kids a lot of a chance to uh, to really develop. We're, we're trying to race these kids through that system. And I mean, do you think some of the problems or, or challenges that we're seeing, again, especially I think when you look at European model versus North American model, do you think some of that stems from in, in uh, the European side, it, it's more of a lifestyle. They're looking for kids who are looking to enjoy and progress in the sport, where here in North America, it's more of a a business entity, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's some correlation between those two as well? Yeah, Larry, you're onto it 100%. Like that, that's really what, what I see as well uh, with some of these programs. In Europe, there's, there's no doubt about it. They have a longer runway uh, or operate with a longer runway than we do in North America. So you're teaching a kid how to skate at four years old. These programs in Europe, and, and I'm just talking in general, not necessarily just for, for um, Europe as a whole. Uh, but sure. you, know, we, you take Jung Older Mannheim in Germany as an example. Hockey is the number four sport in Germany. Um, we'll say if you were to rank in, in popularity, they need everyone to develop. They need all of these players to develop because their mandate at their first team, which is normally, again, like we said, 20 to 35 year olds or so is that 50% of their first team comes from their program. So they don't have to go and spend and bring in a bunch of guys just to fill roster spots. So when they're developing a player and ultimately you're hoping that they can be a first team player when they're 23 years old, you're almost given a 20 year runway to develop a player into what you're hoping they're going to be. In North America, what do we do? We we are worried about winning at U12. We're worried about teaching power plays at U13. We're worried about, the, no, and again, it's a general statement, but right. we sure. may be a little more about banners and draft picks than we are um, developing a, a player as a whole. And you can see the numbers. They're, they're, they're out there as well. And I've, I've done a little research on this too, just in comparison, comparison with North America. And I talk about Ontario and this with the Ontario Hockey League draft. You will see a drastic drop-off in enrollment from players if they are not drafted in the Ontario Hockey League. They may not know that there's other options like Junior A, like we have with Leamington, where we have a couple extra years and we're trying to to help kids get into colleges. Um, but there's there's a sense where if they don't get drafted in the OHL, you know, they've worked so hard for five, six years, they're going to summer skates, they're going to this and that. We've got skills coaches, we've got skating coaches, we've got shooting coaches, we've got practices, all of this that that's happening with these players. If they don't end up getting drafted, they don't make a certain team or whatever it is, they're tired. You know, they're 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 burned out. Some of them have right. lost interest in the game that they love so much just because that's all they've been doing for, for such a long period of time. Um, so I think there's there's definitely, like you said, a, a big win in that, uh, in looking at it from a development model that gives you a longer runway and you're able to add different parts or pieces to the puzzle as you go along, as opposed to trying to, you know, Winning does not necessarily mean development. Development's not necessarily winning. You can do both, but 
uh, it's a it's a slippery slope with with some of the younger ages. Yeah, I listen. That's been a, a huge challenge that we've seen through the years. Is that you know winning winning mindset at too mm-hmm. early an age and not looking at your you know whatever you know your child who's playing the sport and kind of evaluating things from a standpoint of beginning, middle, and end of the season and whether yeah. or not they've improved or developed because. Mm-hmm. Right. If you got all these wins in this championship, but your child didn't improve or develop over that period of time, really, what what was that year worth? It really wasn't right. really worth all that much. Right. For sure. And you I know, mean, you can look at you can look at ice time as the argument. I mean, you'll never find a kid that has said, OK, I, I got enough time on the ice today. I, I think they played me enough. Like it, it just doesn't exist, let alone a parent. But, um, you know, if, if you're on a winning team and you win a U16, but you're on the defined on the fourth line and you're playing five minutes a a night yes you won but did you actually develop like you said right Um, you know and one of the comparisons that was made and i I saved that one for for you larry because i'm sure you'll you'll get the uh, the idea behind it but um it's the idea of the stock market and you know the long-term investment where if you're putting money in right now uh, that may not be money that you need to uh, pull out in six, seven, eight, nine years. You're going to let that grow, and you're going to let it. You're going to pull out when the time comes. Here, it's a, it's a lot of money to play hockey. It's it's very yeah. expensive. It's time consuming. There's you know travel. There's hotels. There's equipment. There's enrollment fees. There's all that stuff that that parents have to pay into. And I sympathize with that, and I worry about that one day because my little guy plays, and it's not that expensive yet. But uh, he's growing a little too fast for me, and he wants to be a goalie. So uh, right. <laughs> I, I'm in trouble already. But you know, there's there's a lot of money that gets put into it. And there's a lot of pressure on at the end of the year, if you can't check, check a few boxes, was that year worth it? What did you get out of that year? That type of thing. The easiest thing that that people in general will go to is we won. We went to the OHL Cup. We, we get a banner that we get to put up in the arena. We won. It was a great year. At U11, I will make the argument that it does not matter that you get to put a banner up at the end of the year. That's that's just me. Great. For some of these programs and some of these younger coaches, and they get that in, in some of these more aligned organizations. If at U10, your your only goal as a coach at U10 is that at U11, all the kids that played for your team play the next year, and and that's the win. They right. enjoyed the year so much they came back. We you know you want to make these kids obsessed with playing hockey and not at 13, 14 years old, not wanting to go to the rink for whatever particular reason it is, because that's where you're going to lose the the interest. And and like they do in Europe compared to we do in, in North America, especially where I see it here, um, where we are in a, a hockey frenzy market, there is a very easy, uh, and it's unfortunate, it's an, it's an easy move to on to the next kid as opposed to the development of the kid that we already have. Um, right. Not necessarily the grass is always greener with some of these kids. If you lose four kids, yeah, there's going to be four kids that are ready to jump in and, and take their spots, no question. But if you've been working with those kids that left for two or three years, it's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. So it sounds to me like there's a couple of really major differences. I know you said, you know, you boiled everything down to those three um, you know, those three items, but it also sounds to me like there's a difference in that outline development path between Europe and, and, and North America. Uh, it seems like there's a different mentality and, and culture, and, and it sounds like part of that's because although you may be part of an organization, every age group is a little bit different because it takes on the culture of whoever that particular coach is. There's not that uniformity and structure that we're seeing in, in the, uh, on the European side of things. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think people would argue that, Hey, you know, North American players, especially like us is getting more exposure at the professional level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe we're doing something right, but let me ask you this, you know, is that giving us kind of a false indicator of what actually is going on? Are we missing out on a lot of talent because of that? 
It's it's possible. I, I think there's a lot, and I, I've done a little bit of reading on it. I've got a few friends of mine that uh, that I've kind of networked with that that kind of look at uh, you know the relative age factor and, and things like that with kids. And and you know at 15, 16, you know we're we're talking about these kids not necessarily being finished products, but um, that's when drafts start coming. Right, you get drafted into the Western Hockey League at fifteen years old. You, your OHL drafts is you know when you're sixteen. So. Like we've got. Well, don't we, they say? I mean, this. I've read, I've read, I've read things about the NHL draft, and I think that it, there's pretty good substantiation that it's one of the most unpredictable drafts out there because the really? kids are so incredibly young when they do it. And that's that's just it. Like you know, uh, we I've had a conversation with uh, an NHL head coach or now former NHL head coach, uh, asking them when is like t- at your level. What age do you want these kids clicking on all cylinders, playing the absolute best hockey they've ever played in their life? His answer was 26. So if you're looking at a 15, 16 year old that's being selected into a a junior hockey program, and, and I'm not saying there's something wrong with the system, but at that age... I mean, that's t- you got a decade in between. That's almost half these kids' lives to develop good or bad habits or good or bad on and off the ice development. You know, like there's so much time in between, and that's why these drafts and in, in any uh, in any particular sport are so unpredictable. Uh, there's stories all the time, and we can always look back at drafts of you know ten years ago. I can't believe this person got picked ahead of this right. person. I mean, you 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 pick with the or undrafted coming in yeah. and killing it in yeah. the league, right? You you pick with the information that you have at the time, but you realize that you might not actually. Like Connor Bedard is a is a bit of a unicorn here. Like you're, you're not going to make the jump from from junior to the NHL all the time. There might be guys that are six or seven years from doing that uh, when it comes to draft time. So yeah, there's 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 a lot that goes into it for sure. But um, I think the the we are certainly much more um, in a hurry in North America compared to where where we are with Europe. Yeah. So let's take a shift for a moment here. You know, many, many of the programs that you talk about, um, you know, and, and many programs that talk about hockey uh, also talk about uh, not only being a vehicle for hockey, but also a vehicle to create, you know, good people. Mm-hmm. You know, how, how do some of these programs, how do they attempt to do that? How, how is that part kind of solved by some of these top programs? Yeah, that that is something that is uh, is a regular theme as well. Um, again, you you're hearing this from programs that are looking to not only have players that come out and and you know maybe get drafted into the NHL or or play pro hockey or whatever it is, right? But the acknowledgement that these kids are at some point going to be contributors to the communities that they live in. They're they are going to be full time employees. You know, I've read some some numbers. Uh, uh, one of the presentations that I did with the coaches' site uh, at their their conference, uh, you know, ninety two percent of the people that are in these programs are at some point going to have a full time job. You know, maybe fifty percent, a little bit less than that, are are going to be fathers at some point. You know, they're all going to be contributors to their communities good or bad. Uh, so the idea behind that is is using hockey and sports as as a vehicle to to mirror life. And, and it does, right? You know, you learn how to work as a team. You learn how to win and lose with grace. You learn how to take criticism. You learn how to deliver criticism. You learn how to handle uh, pressure situations. You know, and we're talking about, you know, you, you got... 10 seconds left on the clock and a face off in the offensive zone and, and trying to get a shot on that, right? There's a pressure situation between that and, uh, and, and what we have to deal with as grownups, but you're, you're building out some of those habits and, and you're teaching some of those, um, those reactions and those results with these kids that end of the day, it is not going to matter if they won or lost that particular game. But if, if they are able to recall some of the things that they've learned uh, as a, as an individual, when they leave that, uh, that program, um, you know, the hope is that just like everybody else that that's in their particular business or a particular sport, you're, you're leaving that business or sport in a better position than it was when, when you first arrived. Um, so that is a constant habit and a constant mindset that these, these programs um, emphasize and, and hurry up, you know, they're, they're hoping that these kids uh, and, and uh, Frolunda was the perfect example of it, the way that they, they explained it, you know, at one point, these kids are going to be leaving their program. They're hoping that they're going to 
have kids that they had a great experience in the program and they want to put them back in the program. They may want to come back and volunteer their time as a coach. They may end up running a business and wanting to sponsor the program uh, and, and putting money back into it that way or time back into it that way. So uh, they realize, and, and, and that's just not uh, that, that program uh, as an example, but they realize that there is a lot that you take out of the time that you're there and the very short time that you're at these programs uh, that, that can last a lifetime. Yeah, I agree. And I, it's great mindset. You know, one, one of the things that I've spoken with a few former athletes on this very show about is, you know, what happens when that playing comes to an end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because that, that, you know, as you alluded to earlier, right, some of these kids are playing from a very young age, it's their identity, it's mm -hmm. their, it's their life. You know, what kind of tools can we provide players for that eventuality when their career, whether, you know, their career is going to come to an end at some point. I, I say all the time to my kids, you know, all roads lead to men's league. It's just yeah. not, <laughs> not a matter of if, it's a yeah. matter of when, right? So you'll end up there some way, someday. So what tools can we provide these young players with, the, you know, that will help prepare them perhaps better because it seems like there's a problem there uh, even with professional athletes coming to an end at, at some point. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is for sure. I think number one, they all need to pick up financial planning made personal. <laughs> Thank you for that plug. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned uh, Men's League. Uh, um, Zug in Switzerland was one of the programs that we featured and Peter Forsberg and his family actually lived there as one of the people that, again, when you... I, I say I connected with Peter Forsberg and talked to him on the phone. Sometimes it's still hilarious to, to hear out loud, even though I saved the recording, uh, just to, to prove that it actually happened. But he's he's playing men's league in, in Switzerland right now. Um, right. You know, so that's two-time Stanley Cup champion, world champion, MVP. He's playing men's league. So we, we all end up there at, at some point for sure. No, I, I think there's a lot to it there. And I, and I think that's where... Coaching has such an incredible impact and, and value of, uh, you know, not just teaching kids uh, the game and, and teaching them the sport. And, and you know, like we said, it, it it's a, a platform to help develop kids for, for life in general. You know, we, we don't give coaches enough credit, especially volunteer coaches at young ages that are, are getting up at crazy hours and driving back and forth and, and all of that stuff. The, the impact that they're having is, is incredible. And I think when we look at these programs, uh, or I've had a chance to look at these programs, for me, this begins and ends with the coaches. If the coaches aren't on board with your development model as a, from a hockey standpoint, um, then it just doesn't work. If you're not using the same language, if you're not coaching the same, uh, uh, using the same type of, of, of formula or systems or whatever it is, it just doesn't work. If, if you don't have a coach that truly, genuinely cares about the success of the player after they're gone from that particular age group. It just doesn't work. Um, you know, the, and that's, that's a lot of pressure on coaches. You know, there, there was a great line um, in the Notre Dame article that we had, and, and this was from the principal, Stefan Govan. He's talking more of a teaching aspect because it was interesting there, a lot of coaches and a lot of teachers, and, and you can tell the, the difference between them, uh, or there's a lot of similarities between them, I should say. His line uh, that, that really stuck out to me was, you know, your one bad day or one bad line from turning a kid off of school or hockey forever. You know, it's a it's a dangerous and, and it's a a very high pressure uh, position that that you're in. There's there's a lot to it. Um, that's why you know it's easy to say, oh, we should all coach like this and talk like this, and 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 everything's going to go well. But there's there's a lot of pressure on coaches to uh, to to do that and and be that positive role model. But if you're a coach and you can spend time with your players, you get a chance to get them know them as people. You can be one of their first role models of, of how to carry yourself um, in an adult life, that's, there's, a, there's a huge impact to that. And that, to me, is one of the things that we, when we talk about when players' careers are done is giving back to the game. You know, uh, there's whether it's financial uh, advantages that they've had from, from playing hockey or, you know, they, they've met people that they've met through building their network through the game, whatever they've returned from the game. I don't think anybody that's been involved in the game can really repay the game as much uh, as they've, they've taken from it. Um, one of the ways of doing that is, is 
bringing that back and giving that back into their communities, uh, into the younger age groups, getting involved in that that aspect of things because there's there's a lot that these players have seen uh, and and learned over time. That's not just uh, things that you can you can teach a kid on the ice. Yeah. Uh, listen, I'll share a, uh, a story that just happened with my son recently. My son recently traveled up to Calgary to uh, to uh, practice with a, uh, a junior team. And we were up there um, earlier this year. And there was a gentleman who was from the same school that uh, my son was at, uh, mm-hmm. Shattuck St. Mary's. And he reached out to me and we connected and we had a conversation while we were up there. And he was like, you know, half jokingly, if your son's ever up here, let me know. You know, I'd be happy to, you know, help him out in any way I can. You know, I'm a fellow alumni, et cetera. So when uh, we knew he was taking this trip, I did send him a message. And uh, long story short is he reached out to my son. And on one, on two of the off days that my son had, he connected with him, Uh took him out to breakfast one day, took him out to dinner another day. And they just had some great conversation about both their times at Shattuck and, uh, you know, talks to that network and and giving back and kind of being there for other players. And, you know, it was a, it was a great relief for my wife and I, with my son traveling so far away and to know that there was somebody on the other end of that trip where, uh, if we needed anything, we knew we could call him. And more importantly, he took the time out of his busy schedule. He's a businessman, you know, uh, works, uh, regularly. And he took time out of his day to, to spend time with our son. So, you know, that's somebody to me who gets it, understands it and, and is willing to give back to the game in the fashion that I think, you know, you're kind of referencing and in, in, uh, in what you just said. Hockey and sports in general are, are just an amazing world, are they not? Uh, you know, that's, yes. that, that's such a great story. And, and you know, I've been so blessed to be involved with with the coaches site and, and with our, our group in Leamington and, and and getting to meet the people that I've met and, and connect with all of them, yourself included, Larry. Like, again, we probably, uh, you being in, in New York and I'm in, as I said, Windsor, Ontario, we probably don't end up crossing paths at some point um, without hockey. And, and now we get to have this conversation. Hopefully it's something that that uh, you know, there's some some people listening that can take some information away from it and and learn from it. And again, with without the game that uh, that we both love, uh, we wouldn't have had the yeah. chance to, to do this. So uh, it's uh, right. it's 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 worth as much as you can give to it. Um, you know, we're we're all uh, we're all crazy hockey dads at some point. It's it's uh, only uh, some of us have a, a limiter on us that uh, we're able to <laughs> to control. There's just uh, a different level of crazy. <laughs> exactly. We're all crazy. There's just a different level of it, but, uh, but it's, yeah. it's a, it's a great game to be involved with. And, and if anything else, um, getting to connect with the people that I've had and, and hear some of the stories that they've had. Um, it's, it's a good feeling to know that, that there are a lot of people out there that again, want to leave hockey in a, a better place than it was when they, when they first got in. Yeah. So Matt, you've spoken with some incredible people from the U13 coach at Yoke Ritt to father Henry at Shattuck, mm-hmm. Uh, to Peter Forsberg, uh, who you mentioned earlier, and Rob uh, Rod Brindamore, the head coach of the Canes. You know, what are some of the biggest takeaways that you've had personally from some of those really great conversations with, you know, arguably some of the best that are associated with the game? Yeah, I think one of the great parts of, of getting to do this is is meeting some of the people that don't get the headlines, right? Like you you mentioned Rod Brindamore, you mentioned Peter Forsberg. I've spoken with Yari Curry at at, uh, at Yokerit and, and just some of the biggest names this game has ever seen. Uh, and then you mentioned Father Henry, and, and Father Henry is one that, uh, of all the interviews that I've done, still stands out to me. Um, after I ended up having that conversation with him, I remember uh, talking to my, my girlfriend, Christine, about it after um, at dinner. And, and I was getting emotional talking about what an incredible person he was over the 45 minute conversation that we had. Um, right. You know, you, you get to connect with with so many different people and, and just see how they're carrying themselves and, and what they're what they're giving and, and where their motivation is. Uh, it's funny in some of the articles that I've written, um, I've had to specifically ask the coaches or, or the, the front office people that I've talked to about when winning comes into the picture because nobody talks about it. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they're talking about developing, like we said, developing the person, giving kids the opportunities, uh, you know, letting them see different, different aspects of the game, um, all of those different types of things. And, and then we have a conversation about, so like when, do, you know, 
for a lot, it matters to for Lunda that they win. You know, these are some right. of the most competitive people you've ever met in your life. But I have to specifically ask them when winning matters, and they all kind of laugh and they say, "Oh, you know, what we're doing at the beginning is is what leads to to winning uh, to to winning hockey." So there's you know there's an aspect to that as well that that you can take from from everything else it's it's you know a, a one day at a time um you know being that one percent better all the cliches that you can kind of think of um but you know the one great thing about the people that i've had a chance to connect to is they all uh, are extremely open with sharing ideas uh this is how they they operate um you know they're they're taking emails and phone calls from somebody who they've never heard of that wants to do an in-depth look into why their their program is as good as it is and they're open books because Again, there's no secret sauce to it. Uh, if anything that I've, I've learned and we've talked about from an organizational level, um, there's no secret sauce to what these programs are doing. They just do a lot of things really well. And that comes with being a collaborative whole group. Um, so if anything, the takeaway from that is anyone can do this. It really takes a lot of work. It takes a big group of people pushing in the same direction. Uh, but it can be done anywhere. Uh, and and that's not to discount what some of these programs do. That's simply to emphasize that what they have operating uh, and a day-to-day uh, f- workshop from them uh, is, is simply something that can be taken and can be not necessarily replicated, but um, done in different areas of the world in, in anybody's backyard if you have uh, the right people with the same mindset. Great stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I look forward to the day where we see more of these types of programs uh, popping up, you know, even in, you know, here in the States in local communities. So, you know, kids who want to, you know, challenge themselves don't have to find themselves going thousands of miles away from home in order to do that. I, I think it, it can be done if done correctly and with the right intentions in, you know, almost every local market. And I, I think the probably the same stands true for, for uh, you know, C- Canada as well. So uh, yeah. I look forward to that day. But Matt, we uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We end each of our shows by asking each of our guests the same uh, final question. We're the Midland Money Mindset. We're all about joy here. And that is, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? Well, I mean, at the time that we uh, we record this, um, you know, one of my favorite parts of the day in the morning, I get to put my kids on the bus. Um, I give them, you know, maybe get about 10, 15 minutes of, of time with them uh, at the bus stop and, and just try to goof around with them and make them laugh a couple times and, and hopefully get their, their day going as well. Um, and then I get to come to work and luckily we're able to work from home and, and my girlfriend works downstairs. And every time I open the door, I get to see her beautiful face and that puts me in a, in a great spot as well. Uh, her daughter, will be home soon as well so that'll make me uh you know more excited and uh, and busier and and it's uh it's great it's you know when you get to celebrate little things like that every day um the, it's impossible to have a bad day nice yeah, that's uh that's great stuff right there so listen we are uh recording this in full disclosure right at the beginning of the nhl playoffs and yeah. this probably won't go live until uh, the Stanley Cup champion has been crowned. Yeah. So uh, let's put you on the spot here for a minute, and we can see if you're right or wrong going backwards when this airs. Sure. Who, who do you got for the 2023-24 uh, Stanley Cup champion? Yeah, I, I caveat with this of uh, when I get this wrong, um, that doesn't discount <laughs> everything else we've talked about. In the, I think in the I know where this might be going, but go ahead. Uh, no, no, you're you're gonna be. Uh, I, I got a feeling of where you're where you're thinking too. But I'm I'm from Windsor, so I mean, I, growing up, I could see Tiger Stadium and Joe Louis Arena from my front lawn. I am a Red Wings fan and a Tigers fan and, and a state of Michigan type guy. Um, and I'm not just saying this because uh, we're on the podcast with you, Larry, but from the very beginning, I, I really like what the New York Rangers have. Uh, oh, wow. I, I okay. like that. I wow. like that team a lot. Their odds were pretty good that they're not a real outstanding, uh, outstanding favorite. I'll never pick the first seed anywhere. I think that's a cop out, <laughs> but okay. I'll take the, uh, I'll take the New York Rangers and the Dallas Stars in the Stanley Cup. Oh, wow. All right. Let's see. Let's see if that happens. I, you know, I think for that to come to fruition, for even the opportunity 
the thing that the Rangers have to do differently this year than they did last year and even the year before is they got to win a couple of these series uh, in, in in the short term. They got yes. you know four or five games. Yeah. They can't go seven, seven, seven and expect you know the bodies to hold up for that uh, that period of time. So no we'll see. I hope that's the case. It'll be a very interesting season. So I'll, I'll take your word for it there, um, and uh, we'll see if you're right when this airs. But uh, listen, if people want to learn more about your series, the, hmm. you know the hockey factories uh, or what you're doing with the coaches site. What's the easiest and the best place for them to do that? Keep in mind, we'll have all of your information in the show notes for people to find that. But mm -hmm. what's the easiest and best ways, ways for them to, to learn more about those things? Yeah. Uh, so the coaches site.com is the website. It is truly the most comprehensive coaching site that you're going to find uh, for, for hockey and, and maybe really any sport in, in general. There's, there's all kinds of information on there. Um, and it's, it's very worth uh, joining on and, and being a member and just reading through some of the articles and, and uh, real in-depth stuff that the website does. Um, I'm on Twitter uh, and Instagram. Um, I, I don't post a ton on, on Instagram other than pictures of my goofy kids sometimes but uh, <laughs> other than that the twitter is probably the easiest way to get me or or by email as well and i, I can give you that one too from uh from the, the coaches site website to, to put in the notes so um it's right. uh, again I love having these conversations. I'm, I'm thrilled to have been on here and, and get a chance to connect with you there, Larry. So um, anybody that wants to reach out, that wants to talk about their program and, and uh, ways that, that they can, you know, become a, uh, a Frolunda 2.0, um, I'd, I'd love to, to help uh, uh, anywhere I can. And again, I, I think my, my goal coming in, uh, there's, there's always been a bit of a, of a, uh, an idea for, for me, I, I never played hockey um, growing up. Uh, I was got involved in the game late. Um, I go out with my kid uh, when he skates at U7, and I can promise you, I'm the worst skater on the ice, including the kids. <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm thrilled to be involved with the game as much as I can be, and, and just trying to put the game in, in a better spot than when I got into it. Awesome. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your knowledge and, and sharing your stories. And uh, I look forward to continuing to, uh, to hear them. Thanks and uh, enjoy your day. Thanks. You too, Larry.